So we, we've got quite a long time slot. I'd like to make this kind of an interactive thing. So i um, going to try and keep an eye on the audience. Interrupt me any time to ask questions, get clarifications, or just tell me where I'm wrong. Um, that's all good. So OCI containers. It's, OCI stands for Open Container Initiative. It was created to create standards around the work that Docker did in the very early days of Linux containers. Um, its mission is to create standards for how the different components can interact. And it ended up prol proliferating the different ways of attacking containers um, into a lot of interesting areas, broadening the original Docker um, monopoly into a, a complete ecosystem. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the current status of FreeBSD support for OCI containers. Um, and I'm going to talk um, about some of the details of container images and possible steps towards having official, officially supported FreeBSD container images. I mean, that's something which several people have pointed out to me is kind of blocking them from being able to, to use FreeBSD in certain contexts. For instance, with Podman, um, the Podman port, it builds in their CI, but we can't test it in CI because it needs a base image that they can't trust by their rules. Until we have a FreeBSD owned and supported trustable image, we can't build that test image that they would then unblock FreeBSD being fully supported in their CI. So um, a couple of other similar conversations have happened over the last year and a half. So let's get started. FreeBSD, um, is, FreeBSD OCI is based on JLM VNet. I mean, people have been running containers on FreeBSD since before Docker existed. We haven't just didn't call them that. Um, I think uh, Jail's been around since 2000. Uh, VNet, which pretty much adds the missing components to let you do interesting networking effects with Jail, that's been around since I think 2007 or so. I'm not sure whether it was production ready in 2007, to be honest. So anyway, um, FreeBSD could do containers for a long time. Um, when we add that with other, other things like NullFS and the PF packet filter, we can do really interesting things. And it covers pretty much the whole feature set of OCI containers. So a few years back, ContainerD was ported to FreeBSD uh, by a guy called Samuel Karp, who I wish he was here, but he's super busy. Um, he's a really nice guy, and he comes from the OCI community and wanted to apply what he already knew about OCI to try and get things running on FreeBSD as a personal project. So he wrote an OCI runtime called RunJ for FreeBSD, which is the runtime is like a encapsulates the details of creating the container. Um, so ContainerD could then use the, this runtime this, to create jail-based FreeBSD containers. It actually works. Um, I could run it now, but I'd, maybe I'll do demos later on. It's missing support for networking, which kind of makes it difficult to use for most, most real workloads. But it does work. Um, and I think with a little more attention, it could be turned into a complete implementation for FreeBSD. Um, I was more interested in the Podman engine. I liked the idea of not having a giant daemon running in the background all the time just so I could run a container. Podman sort of runs, it runs, creates the container, and then goes away. And it leaves a tiny monitoring daemon just picking up the standard input and standard output of the container. So I like that model. So I ported the Podman stack. As, um, I say that it took about a year to get it all upstreamed into the various different repositories. Um, but it was an interesting project. So that's actually quite a complete port. We've got support for networking. We've got support for stats. You can get stats out of your containers, ask which container is run, is using how much CPU, how much network, and so on. So that's close to being viable for, for production, at least for pre-production, with the caveat that you, we don't have a trusted set of images yet. So um, that's all been upstreamed. So the, the Podman source code just builds out of the box on FreeBSD and works. Um, the FreeBSD build is in their CI, and they actually care about it being supported and not breaking going forward. 
they've been a very supportive group. I'm talking mostly about the Red Hat engineers that do most of the work on Podman. They've been very supportive of this work, and that's been quite nice, actually. Going beyond that, a lot of, uh, I don't know what the proportion would be, a lot of Linux containers run in Kubernetes, which is a clustered, clustered um, container orchestration system. Um, again, that, that relies on a, on a smaller component that manages the lifecycle of containers for um, the cluster. So there's a couple of different approaches to that. Containerd is one. One is a thing called Cryo. Um, CRI is Container Runtime Interface, I guess. Cryo is an implementation of that. And I ported that to FreeBSD and um, <clears throat> using that and some hacks on top of Kubernetes, I was able to run a FreeBSD native Kubernetes cluster on two virtual machines in my home lab. It's not a scale-up scale up thing. But so I've been working on upstreaming that work. Um, parts of it are in review. Um, the one outstanding review which when that lands, we'll have functional support for um, FreeBSD Kubernetes nodes. And there's some follow-ups to add more functionality. That's a work in progress. I've got hacks on the kubelet component of Kubernetes, which is kubelet runs on um, all machines in the cluster, and it's responsible for starting and stopping containers as, as things get migrated around the cluster. So I have a port of kubelet. Um, I have a port of something called kube proxy, which, is, which manages the Kubernetes networking model, which I don't really want to go into here, but it allows for virtual IPs to map to services within the cluster. So I have those two ports. I'd like to upstream them, but I need to work out how, to, how the Kubernetes development model works and get the right people in that community to buy into actually having this as a project. So for networking cont with containers, we rely on something called CNI, Container Networking Interface. There's a lot of TLAs in this system. Um, they're basically a set of plugins, like separate binaries that run to do specific functions. Um, and those functions include like creating, like looking around to see if you have the right bridge already, if not create it, um, create a, an ePair, add part of it to the bridge, poke part of it into, into the container, allocate IP addresses, set up the IP addresses within the container, that kind of thing. Um, so I ported an absolute bare minimum of CNI plugins for FreeBSD, and that's enough to support um, typical desktop podman type usages. In cluster environments, there are more complex CNI plugins. I've looked at Flannel, which is very popular. And I think that could be ported fairly easily using FreeBSD's VXLAN. There's another one, another popular plugin called Calico, which uses BGP to manage some of the routing for Kubernetes networking. I think that could be ported, although I'm worried that they seem to be moving to eBPF for, for their implementation, which might be a challenge. For my own purposes, I just set up a, a simple VLAN-based um, network. These, these more complex systems that require VXLAN and so on, they're in much larger clusters than I'm able to test. Any questions so far? So what's a runtime? I talked a little bit uh, earlier on. A runtime is a separate program that the container engine, like Podman, Cryo, ContainerD, or whatever, shells out to the runtime to perform tasks on the container itself. So it allows, it's an isolation, isolation, it's a, an abstraction layer on top of the life cycle of the container itself. Um, so for us, that life cycle involves creating jails, um, mounting file systems into the jails root, files, root file system, perhaps offering a 
point where we can hook in initialization for the network. So creating the gel involves maybe creating a VNet for that to gel and so on. We've got two implementations of the runtime. RunJ was the first one. That was Sam's work that was intended to support ContainerD. Um, I started using that, and it works quite well. I had some, at one point I was, had a lot of patches to it and I had a conversation with Sam. He was like, I want to do most of this myself because this is a learning process for me. And so I was like, well, I don't want to fork your work. So I think I'm gonna write my own runtime and so that I can control the pace of development. And then we can try and converge again in the future. So I wrote this thing called OCI jail, wrote it in C++ because I understand C++ better than Go. <laughs> um, and I'm mostly aiming for compatibility with Podman. Long term, there's no real need for two of them, but right now, right now that's what we've got. I can imagine writing uh, a, an OCI runtime based on Beehive. There's not much of a barrier to, make, to making that work. I have... I think the 9PFS work that I've been promising to get into the tree for a long time is, is an enabler for that because it will allow, allows the host to prepare a root file system for the container and then have Beehive run it. Don't quite understand how networking would work, but it would involve probably a CNI plugin that creates a tap and then some sort of agent running inside the Beehive to apply the the um, IP addresses to the interfaces and so on. I don't need to look and see how the Linux people do this with VMs, but it's certainly possible. So, next steps on this part. I mean, ongoing work to keep the Podman ports up to date. Podman, like I said, usually builds out of the box. Because we don't have full exposure in their CI, it doesn't necessarily work out of the box. So um, a regular chore for me is to update the ports, test them, hopefully not find any bugs. If I do fix them, upstream them, and then basically freshen the ports from there. Um, the kind of cycle I've, I've been going through is to is find minor bugs put them as patches in our ports tree and upstream them after the fact, and that's been working reasonably well. So there's ongoing work to keep that fresh. We've created a working group within the OCI uh, infrastructure to define what a FreeBSD runtime should do. Um, this, this is going to allow us to align the two runtimes, RunJ and OCI jail, to make sure that they're not pulling in different directions. Um, it's going to make it clear uh, or clearer about exactly what features we're supporting under OCI, for OCI containers. Um, we've just started this work. We've got, um, we've had a few meetings. Um, what I would like to get from people is what they would do with a, f a working FreeBSD container infrastructure. What problems would they try and solve with it? And we can try and make sure that we map that onto the specification that we're developing. So user stories are really important, basically use cases. As a user, I would like to be able to do X with a, a container on FreeBSD. Container D support is lagging a bit, mostly because it's been worked on by people with not enough spare time. Um, it would be lovely to see better supporting Container D perhaps with some support for networking, with um, some support for basically running CNI plugins at the right moment so that they can have parity with the Podman implementation. I think monocultures are a bad thing. So con having two container engines with good functionality, I think, is going to be good for us. I need to finish upstreaming the CRI work that I've done. I need to work out how to get the rest of the, rest of the components for FreeBSD on Kubernetes um, reviewed and upstreamed. The kube admin 
programming, Kubernetes is basically a way of building small clusters. There's, a, there's an X509 crypto infrastructure underneath the cluster that's quite difficult to set up. You don't want to do this manually. Trust me, I've done it. I didn't want to. Um, Kubeadam basically does all of that for you. So I need to, to port that to FreeBSD. It's not going to be complicated. It just changes a few path names here and there to put things in underneath user, local, etc., instead of slash, etc., and things like this. So I need to get that done to make it easier for people to actually try out FreeBSD on Kubernetes. Anyway, so let's, move, let's talk about images. Containers with OCI rely on images. Pretty much all OCI containers are, are built on top of images. There's some rare cases where you might do something based without an image, but almost always it's with an image. An image is just a read-only directory tree that contains, free, uh, contains runtime dependencies, such as shared libraries, config files, SSL certificates, along with the application that you're going to run in the container. So container takes an image as a starting point and adds a scratch layer on top <clears throat> to isolate anything that it changes inside that, that image. So the container runs, maybe things happen and it modifies the root file system. It doesn't touch the underlying image, it's held separately. This means you can be clear about where the um, state of your container is and how, that's, how that can be separate from the underlying image. And it's good practice, in fact, to find that state and try to explicitly put it into a, link, a mounted volume so that um, you can literally trash the container and start again and still have your state. So the OCI image format is, a, is content addressed layered format. That when I say content addressed, it's each component is hashed, and the name of the ha and the result of the hash is the name of that object. So if you use hashes, it's um, to, to name the various objects. When you download things from an image registry and you happen to have some of those components, maybe there was a shared base image, it's really easy for the, for the local storage to say, hey, don't fetch that hash. I've got it in my storage already. So it can dedupe. So different objects in the, is it like a graph of, of objects that are doing different parts of the work? The most important part is the image manifest. The image manifest defines the contents of, an, of a single image. And it basically lists a number of tarballs that should be, impact, uh, uh, should be unpacked one by one, one on top of the other, to make the final content of that image. And this, is, this allows you to extend that by adding new layers that perhaps install applications or delete a config file or change something. So the manifest defines the layers that make up the image. Then you can combine those manifests into image lists. Supposing I want um, an image that's going to run on all the FreeBSD tier one platforms. And maybe all of the um, FreeBSD tier one platforms may be supporting different um, OS versions of FreeBSD as well. I could build an image list that lists the manifests of the, the hashes of the manifest of the different implementations, like an x86 version of the image, an ARM64 version of the image, a RISC-V version of the image, and it lists those different hashes and lets the container engine pick the right one when you try and run the image. So image, image lists allow you to make what appear to the user to be multi-platform images. So as I said, all the references between different things in this graph are using the two, SHA-256 hash of the object being referenced, uh, the, and the leaves are 
files that are typically gzip compressed tar files that contain a delta from some other some other image or perhaps if it's the first one a delta against the empty image so the, for the base so char256 hashes are not terribly user friendly way of to, of uh, naming things So apart from the, the so image registries will store all of these, these content addressed objects underneath using the, the hashes, but they also build a user understand, a human understandable namespace on top of that. So an OCI image name might look something like docker.io slash Doug Rabson slash hello colon latest. So let's unpack that a little bit. Docker.io names the image registry that you're going to that you're trying to use. Um, it's just it's a resolvable <laughs> domain name, <clears throat> and <clears throat> we expect to find um, a registry. Uh, it's an HTTP server running a REST protocol that that uh, has functions to do various different things to manage the registry. So the next part in this tuple, effectively, is the, the namespace. So in this example, it's Doug Rabson. That's where I put some of my stuff on Docker Hub. Um, and you can use this to group related images together, or in my case, to um, carve out my own small part of a shared infrastructure. The last part names the image itself. And again, there, there can be multiple images grouped together. Um, so here we've got hello colon latest. We could have hello colon version 1.0, 1.1, whatever. And the latest is typically used to, to name the most recent version of that image. In a, in a normal setting, perhaps with FreeBSD images, we could have, um, we could use, a, use tags to say, okay, okay this is the 14.0 patch level one, patch level two, and so on, so that we can keep, it, keep a, a library of images at the different patch levels to when people perhaps validate their application on one specific image, we don't want to force them to upgrade to, the, to some other patch level. Maybe we do, but we don't have to. So they can, if we keep them around in, in the registry, they can always fetch the exact image that they tested and validated for their product. So let's look at some examples. Hope you can read this. So this is tip, a typical image list. So we can see that it's typed itself, and you, have, you will see the type on both, e both ends. The object stores its own type, and references to the object ref um, have to match that type. So this is saying, I'm expecting to find an image manifest v1 in JSON format at this hash. And whoever was referencing this image list would have expected to find an image index v1 in JSON format at whatever the hash of this is. And this is literally, the hash is literally the SHA-256 of this piece of text. So this image list has two images in it. They're both FreeBSD images. We've got two different formats, two different architectures supported. It's AMD64 and ARM64. So if I run this image from on my Raspberry Pi, it'll pick this one. If I run this image on my, on my desktop back at home, it's going to run this image because it's an x86 system. So this platform is a tuple that describes the, the image 
the platform that can run the image. And we can, it's actually, this is only showing part of it. For the architecture, you can have a variant field. So we can say ARM64 with ARCH64, or perhaps some other ABI. ARM64 with um, ARM v7 as a variant. Um, you can actually, on Windows, they use a version field here to specify the ABI version. And this is something which was potentially interesting for FreeBSD as well. So we could have, we could use that to say, this is an image that was built for 14, or maybe 14.0, um, and it's got the other features. And then we can build multi-platform images that have back compatibility because they will work on, say, FreeBSD 13 or so on. But you don't have to think about that when you use them. I haven't tried to use this. I know this support is completely missing in Podman. I think it's only implemented in Containerd. So using the version option would take some work, but I think it's quite potentially useful for us going down the line because of the way FreeBSD defines um, ABI compatibility for user land. So this is an example of an image manifest. Again, I hope you can read it. It's saying, I'm an image manifest in JSON format. So the pointer that was applying to it can validate that it's not pointing some, something stupid by checking that. It's referring to another object called the image config. I'm not going to go into details on that, but that co contains things like what environment variables to set for the image. What's the default command that's going to run unless you override it? Um, metadata about how it was built, maybe even a description of the image and so on. It's quite freeform. Alongside the, the config, we've got the layers that make up the image. And these are applied in order. So this guy, I built the image so I know what's in it. This guy is just um, the result of running mtree on an empty directory to create the FreeBSD directory tree. Um, this one, I think, adds SSL certificates and stuff into that image. This one adds some libraries, like CLib. And this one adds the FreeBSD runtime package base package, which adds a shell and some utilities. And the result is an image where you could run a simple shell without much support there. Um, you can have metadata in this as well. So this is saying this was built from 14.0 patch level 6 package base set. Actually built this from the um, FreeBSD published packages. That's, it's been nice to have package base supported out, out there on the FreeBSD infrastructure. So this is this part is saying this is this is the name that it had when I built because this is this is a, intended to be used as a multi platform with a multi platform image list. But when I built it I can I build them one at a time with more specific names. And that name doesn't usually get pushed. Questions? So typically, people don't build their own base images. In Linux, Linux images are typically applications installed onto some base image. And the base image will contain the libc is going to contain all the other libraries it's going to contain certificates sometimes shells and tools and so on and your application is just layered onto that i think one of the motivating factors for containers on linux was they had so many distributions and people wanted to be able to run a debian application on their fedora box and vice versa 
So this way of packaging up the distribution artifacts alongside the application allows that portability. It's not so much of a problem for FreeBSD, but it's still nice to be able to run FreeBSD 13 stuff on a FreeBSD 15 dev. So, you know, we have a much smaller problem, but it's still, the, still something useful to do. There's been a lot of evolution in base images on the Linux side. People have been innovating, trying to optimize for space. Um, the smallest image I was able to find is Alpine, which is eight megabytes for something that supports a shell plus utility. It's pretty interesting. Um, that one is built on top of BusyBox, which has been around for a long time, been used in embedded work for the same purpose. Uh, it's basically slash rescue. Yeah, yeah. I, so I'm, uh, rescue is a bit bigger. Yeah. Not a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so just for the, for the recording, Warner said, it's like slash rescue. And yeah, it absolutely is. And I think that BusyBox was probably inspired by rescue. I built a FreeBSD BusyBox, because BusyBox is in our ports tree. It's not as complete as the Linux BusyBox, but it's got some interesting stuff in it. One, I was trying to build base images for Podman CI. I wanted an image that behaved as much as possible like the, the um, test image that they were using, it, that was built on Alpine. So I've just built it based on FreeBSD BusyBox, and that was about eight megabytes. So um, more traditional kind of, so for the people that don't know, Rescue, BusyBox, they basically take a lot of utilities and squeeze them all together into a single binary so they can share a maximum possible, so, possible amount of code. And um, they usually um, make, it usually makes them much smaller than having many separate binaries. Without doing that, the smallest image I could find was 78 megabytes for Ubuntu's base image. And this is enough, has enough functionality to run a shell and install some more packages, basically. Often, there's no need to have a shell. If I'm just running Nginx as a proxy, I don't think I need much more than libc, actually. Maybe I need some SSL utilities. So um, Google started up a, a project called DistroList, which provides super small base images that contain as little as possible. Uh, their motivation was making them small and reducing attack surface for when there are compromises. If there's no shell, then the attack can't shell out and do something within the container. I don't know how important that is from a security point of view. Multiple people have told me recently that Linux containers aren't intended to be a security fix, that you need to look at VMs to do that. But they certainly reduce the, the attack surface if there is a compromise. Some workloads don't even need shared libraries. I have one that's based on something called Catatonic, which is the smallest and dumbest version of init that they could implement. It's a statically linked application that has no config files and thus has no dependencies on any other uh, parts of the operating system. You can just build an image containing only that binary, nothing else, works well. I think that's a special case. You often need a bit of configuration stuff. A lot of things need cell certificates. A lot of things behave better if they have time zone um, files. So the DistroList project creates a static image that contains just config files, no shared libraries. It contains an image called base, which contains shared libraries. Um, and then there's, uh, there's a range of other things that contain things like toolchains, Java, C, C, C++, and so on. But I think I like the idea of having small images. And I like the idea of having images that didn't give you a shell even if you didn't need it, or give you man pages that no one's ever going to read. Let's think about FreeBSD images. I mean, I think that images are important to give 
image developers somewhere to start. Let's give them something they can trust. Um, and this is something which people have told me that they want to be able to, they want to be able to, to have a base image that they can prove has been developed by the, and supported by the FreeBSD project. And not some random person called Doug Rabson that says, download my image from Docker. <laughs> Go on, it's going to be fine. I mean, maybe you guys know me, and maybe you trust me. Maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. <laughs> but some, some, somebody else that's not been part of the FreeBSD project has no idea who I am. And why should they run my image? I remember somebody was porting a component of ContainerD, and they were wiring up to the CI, and they wanted to use one of my base images. And the comment came up in the review is, what is this image? <laughs> and why are you using it? So yeah. I think it's important to have, to have images that um, the project supports. And the then question is, what goes in the image? I mean, base.txz is huge. Uh, it, last time I looked, it was about a gigabyte once you unpack it. It's got everything in the kitchen sink. It's great if you're building a physical machine. You need all of that stuff. And that's FreeBSD's selling point, like a complete system. But for container images, you don't need the complete system. A lot of times, you don't want the complete system. You certainly don't need all, all, all the shell utilities and all the man pages when you're just running your Nginx proxy. Fortunately, package base kind of helps us a lot here. Package base breaks up that monolith for base.txz into about 400 odd uh, much smaller packages. So we could use that. And in my experiments, I certainly used that. And that image which I showed you earlier was built using package base to, to layer in different package base packages on top of other images. <clears throat> package base has more than 400 images, so the, we can't offer all the combinations. Um, what's 400? 400 factorial is too big. There's too many combinations. <laughs> we, we have to narrow it down a little bit. So I'm going to follow the path that's given, given by Distralis and say we should have an image that supports static-based workloads, like statically linked um, programs. We should have an image that supports dynamically linked programs that don't do any shell stuff. And when I say support supports a, a strong enough subset for that to be viable. Within those, those dynamic workloads, it's very common to, to require SSL. It's very common to need time zone stuff and probably some other config files. So salt in whatever extras that in, improves the compatibility of that image. And even if we miss stuff out, it's OK. It's really easy to add the missing shared library or whatever. Um, when you're building your application. Things are a bit more varied for shell-based stuff because the nature of shell scripts is that they shell out and do stuff with all other stuff in the image, like the different utilities. But the smallest image that we can build with package base without breaking open a, a package and installing fractions of it is an image that's based on the FreeBSD runtime package base package. I wish it wasn't called package base, actually. It seems weird to say package base package, still. <laughs> we need another French word. <laughs> Maybe we do. What's French for package? <laughs> That's a good one. The comment for the, for the recording, the comment was, we need another French word. So anyway, um, we can build the smallest shell-based image that I can build with package base is based on FreeBSD runtime. And it turns out that comes in at about 70 megabytes, which is similar to Ubuntu. So we are competing. This is great. Um, that actually doesn't have much in the way of command line utilities. So I often add the FreeBSD utilities package, which has a much more complete set that allows for more um, shell script compatibility.
What should we name them? I don't like the names from Distrilis. Base is confusing for us. We see base and think a gigabyte in a big compressed bundle. Um, what should we name stuff? If we, if we can get some um, consensus on what to put in the image, images, we should probably try and figure out names that work for us. I suppose we could use the name of the package base component. That ends up with something which I don't really like the look of, like CA root for the static bit, CLibs for the dynamic bit. I don't think these are great names. I don't know. I'm not good at naming things. I mean, I called my, my project New Bus <laughs> because it was a new version of bus. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm open to suggestions on what goes in these things and what they should be called. But I think we need them. I think if we can narrow it down to just three images, like literally for those three classes, static, dynamic, or doing a bit of shell, then that's going to be enough to get people started. And the image that I build, build for the shell also has package pre-bootstrapped so that you can very, very easily write a Docker file that says, hey, start from this, this image and install utilities or install Kerberos or whatever it happens to be that you need that wasn't in that image. So I think it gives us enough for people to build on and do whatever else they need. And with package base being um, available in our own kind of CDN, then that's enough to, to get people started in most cases. So how do we go about building these things? Assuming that we have consensus on the contents and the names, we should be able to build them. It needs to be part of the FreeBSD release process. If the FreeBSD project is going to support these images, it has to have built them. And we have to be able to show that the artifacts we're offering are actually the ones that were built. This is really important for the release engineering team. We've had conversations about this. So it should be part of the FreeBSD release process. It should be part of the regular snapshot building process. I've looked into hacking on the, the source slash release um, part of the source tree, changing, perhaps changing release.sh to add an uh, option to build OCI images. And we could export the, these images as um, OCI archives, which basically takes all of the it takes all of the the objects, the the layers, the manifests, the image lists, and adds them to a, um, a standardized format table. So those are those artifacts could then be published alongside base.txz, perhaps, or somewhere else. Colin. Right. Yes. Um, question is, um, did, was the question about should we have these as part of 14.1? No. They, no. They, they're not supporting, I, I'm building 14.1 release on Friday. Yes. But that is why nothing has happened about this yet. I, I have not been able to get back to the release now. But right. I will, I will soon, I promise. So, yeah, Colin, Colin saying, yeah, 14.1. Um, is, is stopping release eng, release eng from thinking about this stuff, and that's absolutely fine. And you know, the, I know some of the people that probably were writing those emails, and I told them they've lost, they've they've missed the boat for fourteen one. That um, perhaps we could do something after the fact, but the release is going to be cut this week. Yes. So the the maybe people have had um, exciting. Expectations, but it's not going to happen for 14.1, and that's okay. I want it to happen eventually. The time, the time span is not important as long as it happens, because the time when it's not happening it stops people from using our, using this project, and I want people to use the project. 
So yeah, um, we could we could implement the build individual platform images, like not the image list thing. We could create archives, which are tables, so they're build artifacts that we can store in the result of the build. Perhaps put them alongside base.txz so they can have um, verifiable checksums that we create as part of the build process automatically. We can put them somewhere on download.freebsd.org. It's easy to download these things and add them to your own local registry. Um, Scopio is a, is a utility that the Red Hat folk wrote to manage images. It predates Podman. They, they were using Docker and they just wanted some better tools. So they wrote this thing for moving images between registries. And one of the things it can do is import and export from tar files. It's quite nice. Podnap, Podman image load is a subcommand of Podman that does basically the same thing. So you can, it, supposing we had a future where there was a well-known place on download.freebsd.org that contained OCI format image archives. People could import them into their registry, run a local registry, import them into that and use them. Um, so thinking about the release process, it's kind of opaque to me, but I don't understand how patch releases work. Package base is able to do to hook into the patch release building infrastructure so that it can publish new package base sets when there's a new patch level. I don't know where that goes. <laughs> Release.sh does one particular, I can build from an arbitrary git hash with release.sh. What I really want is somewhere to hook into the existing infrastructure for building regular, regular releases, like snapshots and patch releases. That's something which I'm going to have to ask people how it, work, how it currently works, because it's all a bit of a mystery. Distribution. I talked about people perhaps downloading stuff from download.freebsd.org. That's not really how people do that in the real world. Registries are there to make it easy to use images. And one of the things that, they, that makes them easy is you can just take a, a name of an image, including the name of the registry, the namespace, the repository, the, the version, and just say, pull that. Pull that and run it. And this just, you know, it looks in your own local storage. It downloads the bits that it doesn't already have, and then it runs it. And that's done by the registry. So the registry has two jobs. I said, I'm adding, th no, I'm adding a third job. I said two jobs earlier. The first job is to store the stuff. Second job is to name the stuff. And the third job is to give network access to it, pushing and pulling for people using the image or updating the image. We could run our own. Um, there's the Docker registry works really well. It's in the ports tree. We could use that. Um, there's a newer implementation of registry, which I use locally in my lab called Zot. I think we'll probably get that into the ports tree at some point. Um, it does the same thing, but it has a little web UI on top, which makes it pretty. Also, it does some, some um, image signing verification stuff and has hooks for um, vulnerability checks as well. We could use existing infrastructures. One of the nice things about the OCI um, formats and the standardization process is that without any changes at all to the existing infrastructure. I can use Docker Hub to store my FreeBSD images. I can use Cray or GHCR because they all, co all implement the same standards. So we can use existing infrastructure that the Linux community already uses to, to download millions of images every day probably. We, could, we don't even have to, to build out our own infrastructure for this. This is great. So we could use existing infrastructure. GHCR is interesting. 
because we already use GitHub. GHCR, for people that don't know, is the GitHub Container Registry. Okay? Um, and the way that works is it goes with the GitHub users or projects. So GitHub slash FreeBSD is something which we already own and manage. And so we could potentially use that to store images and to give access to those images. And that would be a place that's provably controlled by the project. Still kind of like registry.freebsd.org though. Um, we should distribute multi-architecture multi image lists, as I mentioned, so that people don't have to remember what type of computer they're using. They can just run stuff. It's not helpful to use a different image name on the different platforms. Um, and it actually makes it more difficult for to build um, market. So to build, building multi-architecture images is built into the Docker file kind of process. If I a Docker file describes a set of steps to modify some image and create a new image. If the starting point was multi-architecture, and I provide the right command line flags and build it with, say, Podman or Builder, it can build all of them and, and package the rest into a new multi-architecture image list. It's super easy. That's what I do for building these images, I start from a multi-platform base image and then layer in multi-platform variants on it. So we should absolutely support that. So we're going to have to tie together the artifacts that we built earlier on and make sure that we can link together the matching images from the different architectures that we support. No. So the, the comment is, the question is, do you have to download the whole thing to be able to use a multi-platform? This is the beauty of it. The, the, you have to download the image list. And then the image list will tell you which other thing to download. You don't have to download the other parts. The image list itself is tiny. So the, you look through the image list, find the best match. That gives you the hash of the image manifest. Again, the manifest is tiny. You download that. That tells you the hashes of the layers you need. And you may have some of them already. So you look through your, your local storage and download the pieces that you don't have. So minimal, it automatically gives you a minimal download. I don't know whether it caches the image list locally. I think it probably does. Right. Then, um, so let's, the let's go back to the example. OK. This is that image list. So um, if I have some name that refers to this image list, like FreeBSD stuff, um, I tell Podman to run that name. He looks at it and says, OK, that's an image list. I can tell because it's of the type. So then he looks at the local platform, says, OK, we're running FreeBSD. That's great. Um, it's uh, ARM64. Let's say I'm doing this on a Pi or something. So the image list then tells him that this is the hash I need. This is the hash of the image manifest that's going to be right for this platform. Then we can, again, we can then look in local storage to see if we have it. If we don't, we download this hash from the, the same registry that we were talking at. Yes. So he looks at the, so the, the architecture is pretty much, no, it's not fixed. We can, we can run emulated images. So we'll start by, uh, Podman starts by defining the platform tuple. It defaults to the operating system which built it, like FreeBSD. It defaults to the um, architecture of, that's currently running. So let's say that's AMD 60. Um, yeah, so it's ARM 64. 
um, then there's command line flags to let you override those things. So I can say, I can be running AMD64, but I actually want to run the ARM64 image under emulation. So I can override those pieces. And I, do, I regularly override the OS thing so I can run Linux images. Does that answer your question? Okay, grab me afterwards and we'll go, go into any gaps. Yeah, yeah. So um, why, why it would be a bad idea to put like individual libraries into separate images? So if I, like, if I have like an NGX, right. the NGX can be built only with like libc, it practically does itself, and that's it. Yeah. So the question is, um, what, what, are the, what are the downsides of making images, it, making images, if I understand it, individual libraries in, in individual images. You end up with a lot of layers, so there's a computational cost of combining the layers. So there is a definite trade-off there. Absolutely, it would work if you did it this way. Um, and assuming they were, the, those things did not conflict in any way that weren't touching the same, same parts of the, the file name space. You can layer them quite easily. But there's a cost of, um, composing the layers. So in, in, I usually use ZFS for storage. Um, so each of the layers, each layer is, built, is applied on top of some other layer, okay? To do that, we do, um, we take a snapshot, we clone the snapshot, we mount the snapshot, and we unpack the new layer into that. And that gives us the next part. So you end up with a lot more ZFS data sets. But you know, maybe that's not a problem. Right. Okay. So, but the 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 paradigm that. So let's look at the the next slide here. So these are these are applied in a strict order. And um, that's just the model that they took. We could certainly. I could imagine just changing the order, but there's still going to be an order that they get applied in, and that's the. the if we step outside that paradigm, that we that we're not, we don't have a single vertical ordering, then I think a lot of stuff is going to break. It'd be a lot more work. You can certainly start from scratch. You can start from the empty image, and and install lib the whatever libraries you want. Package based makes that fairly straightforward, and that's how I get started with package based. I start from. Yeah. But it, each layer, I mean, if you're building them, supposing you're building the ideal base image for Nginx that's not going to support anything else, right? You can start from scratch and build, um, insert the exact packages for using package base into that, into that empty directory and make a, an, a tailored base image for your workload. That's absolutely fine, and that will, and that will work. Maybe that's exactly the right answer for certain specialized problems. But um, just let me complete this thought. I think that we can't supply all of those carefully handcrafted base images for all the possible applications because we don't know what those applications are. So, question. So the, yeah, the question is, when you're creating an, an image, you don't create layer, you, you create a, a new layer by installing packages into that layer. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what, what we do, and that's how my tools work. So typically, there's a, there's a main package I want to install, but there's usually a couple of extra bits and pieces that that package needs. So um, I might install FreeBSD runtime, maybe a couple of extra libs that, that my gut feeling says are gonna help support a bigger class of applications. And, that's, and that becomes one layer, so it's contained more than one package base thing. Yeah. So where did we get to? 
I think we were near the end anyway. So building, so we're distributing. Okay, let's talk about verification. That's an important step. We have one, one question from uh, online. Uh, someone asked, is it okay to have the same, like FreeBSD in multiple registries? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so the, if you put, and I do this already, um, so I put my, my test images in Docker Hub and, and it's in Cray. The reason I started doing that is because the rate limits on Docker Hub are more restrictive than Cray. <laughs> so, and yeah, if you're logged into, if you, it's not usually a problem for me, but if you're not logged into Docker Hub, it's pretty draconian about shutting you down once you start download a few few bits of uh, stuff from them. Anyway, um, yes. And in actual fact, if I download an image from Docker Hub, and then the next day I download an image that was built from that that happens to be stored on Cray, the hashes allow it to only install the new, new layer. It doesn't have, because it knows the hashes, the hashes on Cray will be the same as the hashes on Docker Hub. Because the, when I push them, they, that's, that's the data that I push, and it's not allowed to change that. So it can download just the delta. It doesn't matter where the original base was downloaded from. So verification. If we distribute our, um, OCI archives on download.freebsd.org, we can put checksums next to them. This is what we do for most of our release artifacts. Whenever we build a release, the the area on um, the release area on download.freebsd.org contains a manifest that has the checksums of all of the pieces that we that we're releasing. So we can put those checksums in, and that's pretty much how people tend to trust FreeBSD releases now. And this is how most people trust images in the Linux world. Most people don't use image signing. Um, people use trusted registries. Docker Hub's been around for a long time. They haven't been hacked, at least not that I remember. Um, they haven't done something stupid like modify people image, people's images. So people trust them. And they even have an infrastructure of Docker trusted, Docker verified images where they have a public build process that can be triggered by new releases of a piece of software that um, it will run, um, it would build an image based on some Docker file that's been supplied to them by the vendor and apply this, would put this in the Docker Hub registry and put a check mark on it to say, we built it, you can trust it. And people do. I mean, we could apply a subset to that if we, if we ran our own registry. If the only people that can push new data to registry.freebsd.org are the release engineers, then it's a reasonable step for most people to trust that images that they download from registry.freebsd.org are official ones. And that's how most, most things actually work in, in practice. But there is a concept of signing images, and there's a lot of flux here. Um, there's a lot of research on how the, what the best way of proving an image or a collection of images is the one which you wanted, the one which you believed was correct. Red Hat implemented a system using PGP that when an image is pushed to a registry, at the point of push, it, know, it knows the, exactly the hashes that are being pushed, and it can locally create a signature based on a PGP private key to create a signature of the manifest, just the manifest of the thing being pushed. And that's secure because the manifest refers to other data, but it refers to them by hash. And unless you can crack the SHA-256 hashes of the things being referred to, it's going to be really hard for you to break that. Maybe SHA-256 isn't big enough now, but we can change the hash if necessary. 
So that's how it works. Um, I push the image. I push it in the, my config file says, hey, sign. Oh, no, actually, there's a command line flag. So I push it with a, a command line flag that says, please sign this as well. So it signs the, hat, the, signs the manifest and stores the signature locally. And I can then, as some sort of administrative step, make those signatures available. And it's typically done by publishing them to an HTTP server. They tend to call it a look aside server because when you're pulling an image, you look aside to get the key from somewhere else that you trust. Again, this is trusted perhaps because you're downloading signatures from Red Hat to, to verify Red Hat images. And so you set up your config locally to set up a look aside server with the address that Red Hat's told you is the trusted place for signatures for Red Hat images. This actually works. I, I looked into this. It, I implemented it locally. It does work. Only Red Hat supports it. Container D people don't want it. So it's not the full solution. Um, SigStore. Actually, SigStore is, is, covers a lot of ground. But originally, I think it started by trying to do the same thing, but with X509 keys. So you build a public key, private key pair with X509. On image push, you sign with the private key that's available locally. And you push the image. And this time, we also push the signature. So the signature can be pushed as an object in the registry. So it's stored alongside. And they have a naming thing, so that it's kind of named with the hash of the thing that it signed, something like that. I don't want to go into the details, but it does kind of hang together. So the, it, the image got pushed. The signature was generated of the stuff that was being pushed. And that signature is also pushed to the registry that, um, that you're uploading to. And then verification for... So verification for lookaside, we talk about that, talked about that. You download the signature from the HTTP lookaside and check it against the um, data you downloaded. With SigStore, you do the same thing, except that you, you download the signature from the registry that you're trying to pull from, using a rule to create the name of the, the uh, signature so that you can know what you're downloading. So, and this all happens automatically, then you can verify that somehow. Sig store in this early stage um, doesn't, do, doesn't do key management at all. But what, you, what I can do is perhaps create, perhaps install the pub key of the organization that I, that I want to trust and check against that and set up my configuration to when I'm downloading from registry.previously.org, I will verify against this pub key that is stored in, in my local file system. Yeah. The question is, um, how reproducible image was? That's a really good question. I tried really hard to make them re reproducible, but package base fought me. So um, I can make the contents of the image apart from the package based metadata reproducible. I can force the timestamps of all the files in a layer to be a predictable value, like, for instance, the, the date that the patch release was, was cut. And the yeah, and the ordering of the layers is is consistent, but package base uses SQLite to store its metadata, and SQLite doesn't like being reproducible. It had timestamps in the logs. I managed to force the timestamps, but they still were not reproducible, and I got stuck. I couldn't figure out what to, what to change. If we nuke the SQLite data so that we don't have the package. We don't, have a, an, uh, we don't have a log of what was installed in that image. Then we can make them reproducible, but they're less useful. So there's a trade-off there. That's a great question, though. Because for me, there is a two attack vector that are often on those two. <laughs> <laughs> for example, repeat my question. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, I think that uh, there are two like uh, two attack vectors that are often overlooked. So one is yeah. reproducible builds, mm -hmm. right? So even even stuff like ordering the files in the tarball right, timestamps, right, right, as right. you mentioned, right? Yeah. Uh, so this uh, this would protect us from, or I can, as uh, someone who consumes FreeBSD, verify this that this source code was. Yeah. used to build this, uh, so this has to be easy. I have to be able to verify that independently. So, right? so, the, so, if, so we, if we look at it from the, from the model of the, the way that the image is assigned, we're signing the image manifest. The image manifest refers to those layers by hash. So if someone changed one of the layers to do something nefarious, the hash wouldn't match anymore. And you could not down, you just, you can't download the, no, the no, broken no. I, image. I mean that an actual Colin will agree yeah, with yeah. me it's a, that it's a during murky. The, our release process, yeah. if, if, if right. there is something malicious in, 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 in our right. infrastructure, right? right? So that's one. And the other attack vector is that uh, if someone can publish the image secretly, so it won't be published, like I can force someone to download the image and it's built by our infrastructure, but right. it's not uh, published somewhere else. So I want to like target specific victim, right? Yeah. So, uh, but for this, we would need something like uh, certificate transparency, but for binary builds. So yeah. if, if we build an image, we also like publish the image somewhere else. Yeah. And then somebody who downloads mm. the image also check this somewhere else. And I'm not an expert and I'm kind of just been reading about this recently. So Sigstor is an evolving project, and that's the, one of the directions that they, they're evolving towards, where a developer builds an image and uploads the signature to a trusted log. And it's an append-only log, so that you have some trust there, um, that you can verify the, the trust, the root trust certificates of that log, and users that are downloading the image can check against this, this log. So, yeah, this is involves buying into the trustability of the, of the infrastructure being supplied by the Sigstore kind of group. I think it's possible to run it's possible to run your run this locally. It's it's all open source, but there's some two two major components. One to right, yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah, this is this is something. That um, I talk about. This is the line: cosine that adds keyless signing. This is part of that. I'm not an expert enough to know whether it solves the problems that you described, but it's certainly something look worth looking at. Okay. Next steps for FreeBSD images, like we talked about it before. Try and add some code to source release to get the thing, the ball rolling. Wait for Colin to finish doing 14.1 so that we can kind of work on some of that stuff. Figure out the, how the, uh, the build cluster works. I, it's, it's very murky. I don't even know where the code is. Um, so I'd like to understand that a bit better. Um, yeah, figure out what the best way of publishing images that we can, that we're all collectively happy with and feel like it can be trusted. Um, what I want to get to is that you people trying to use, perhaps people coming from Linux that we've, we've sold them on FreeBSD as an alter, alternate version of uh, the alternate, a viable alternate for, for, for Linux. We talked about that showing up as a meaningful thing in the, um, in the survey. They're going to expect some of the, the tools that they're familiar with. People use Docker all the time to run to run stuff. It's really great. You can download the image that's got the right tool chain for building the thing you want to build. You run the Docker file. It all just works. You don't have to debug the tool chain and things like this. And yeah, I'd like people to have that experience on FreeBSD. The first step is to be able to download an image. So I think we should help with that. That's all I've got. Any more questions? Um, John? Yeah. I'll just wait. Okay. Especially out of line. So okay. just to be clear, um, this is running FreeBSD jails on a FreeBSD host, in essence? Yes. But uh, do you also run, like, 
And you mentioned Linux earlier. Is that using a VM? Is it using a jail? Oh, so with the, when I run Linux images under emulation, I just use FreeBSD's built-in Linux emulation. Um, it, it works well enough to support most things. That um, There are images out there that we will never be able to run because they require magical things like C groups v2 or some NVIDIA driver that we don't have kernel modules for or whatever. There will always be images that we can't use, but our emulation works well enough for, to, to run Linux stuff and it, it works surprisingly well. Um, for, for running um, different architectures, QMU works pretty well. I still need to tie up some loose ends with Warner. <laughs> now that we're in the same time zone, maybe we can get that done. Um, so to make that easier, but you can inject a Q, the right QMU static into, into an image when you run it, and it works. Um, yeah, anyway, one more question up at the top there. Um, so what's resource management like in terms of limiting your container to running a certain amount of cores, a certain amount of memory, that kind of thing? That's a great question. Um, so we have some infrastructure um, to support resource limiting. Um, so RCTL, is that right? Yeah, RCTL um, is an, a, um, a system for restricting access to resources for some domain. And that domain can be a jail or so, or a process, or maybe a process group, I'm not sure. So we, we can absolutely use that. I've not implemented this. And this is something which we're going to try and work on standardizing as we, as we define what an OCI runtime for FreeBSD should, should do. But yeah, so the answer is we don't do anything, but we know what we want to do. Okay. Um, I work on ZFS, um, and I was just do you have any particular thoughts about what more ZFS could do to support this? I was, it's good to see you've already, you know, using cloning and everything to, to, <laughs> to build that like that obviously right. makes sense. One thought is simply can the, can a snapshot be a, like be the registry kind of thing? Like could I replicate images to other machines? Are there, is that useful? Are there facilities that you thought, oh, if ZFS could do that, yeah. that'd be gold. What do you need? So um, the, the part, to, can, can ZFS be the registry? It actually can. I mean, so Podman's storage layer, um, it applies the, it unpacks the layers and, and applies them locally at pull time. And, and if you're using the ZFS storage driver, that's exactly what they do. They create all the right snapshots and do the clones and things. I think. Container D might be a bit more complex. I think it might only unpack things on demand. But again, um, it uses, if you're using the ZFS snapshotter, then it uses ZFS in the same way to, to do clones. The one feature which ZFS kind of already supplies that I think we could use is diff. Um, so when, I, when, I'm create, when I'm calculating what the delta layer is for some container that I just run, Maybe I'm creating a new a new image layer. Um, it's kind of brute force. We take take the two trees and we diff them, <laughs> right? And ZFS can help with that. It already can do this, but I don't think anyone's tried to do it. Um, yeah. More questions. Just wondering, Doug, if you want to show people the uh, link to the. GitHub repo for the working group or the Slack to get involved? I'll put it on the Slack. Okay. I'll put it on the Slack. Yep. No more questions? Oh, one more. You're not getting up <laughs> so, sorry if you mentioned this already and I missed it, but what's the, like, what's the privilege model when you're actually using Podman to start up containers? Do you need to run it as root? And then, like, how do I, what, what privileges do I actually need to access it in right. general? That's a good question, and I meant to I, I meant to point this out, but yeah, we have to run as root. Um, 
I don't, we, we don't have a mechanism of being able to run rootless containers. The way things work on the Linux, I mean, I'm talking about jail-based containers here. Um, the way things work on Linux is they have something called a user namespace. You can carve out a, a, a UID range and then map that um, to an unprivileged, unprivileged user on the host. And that works well enough to run quite a lot of, of workloads in an unprivileged way. To, to get there, we need to do quite a lot of work, and we haven't done that work. We could run, if we had unprivileged Beehive, that would sound exciting to me. We could do stuff in, in, a, in a Beehive VM. Does that answer your question? I can guess at some answers to this, but why exactly does jail create need to be a privileged operation? Well, that's a good question. I don't think I can fully answer that, but I do know that mostly I run root inside the jail. I know it's a restricted root. I know that jail applies some restrictions, but I think that the trust level of of how strong those restrictions are is probably what's guiding us to make creating a jail a privileged operation. One way to compute the jail in the root that more privileges than unprivileged jail Creating a jail and talking to can can we can we try and get some of this onto the onto the recording? So, so I just wanted to, to clarify that, like, I'm talking about creating a jail specifically and attaching to it a separate operation. So, I mean, attaching to a jail as root in the jail, I would expect to require root privileges on the right. host. Right. Can you create a jail without dev? Oh, yeah, you need a dev mount. I think Colin might have an answer for us or another question. If you can create a jail as non-root, then you can do nasty things with set UID binaries. But the security problems more or less go away if you uh, create a, a, a jail that has set UID disabled, which I think we have okay. a feature for to see to turn on with a sys 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 hmm. Yeah, that one. You can all come down to the front, maybe. <laughs> so this is what I meant. If you can, as an unprivileged user, can create a jail, I assume you control the content of the jail. So it can contain set UID binary. So basically, you can control the root inside the jail. And I think it has different set of privileges than unprivileged user outside the jail. I mean, so that would be the escalation. Yeah, okay. but I, I think there's, there's also... We've had, certainly had people been able to exploit their way out of jails and to, to break. Yes. So if I if I imagine as a non-privileged user creating a jail that allows a root process to run inside, I feel like I'm enabling that risk for something I don't, don't have the privileges to make the cho that choice. But I will give you a better answer, okay? Uh, so <laughs> what we would really like to do is to be able to have something like Cloud ABI, if you remember this project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so this was actually an awesome response to this problem. So mm -hmm. not only you can create small containers, the container can be like a single process, which has no access to global namespaces. And you can chain those containers together and be able to like connect them together, right? So if we could support this, so we could have Beehive as a full-blown virtual machine. We could have jails. And if we could have like single process containers or like group process containers, but with no global namespaces, right? That would be, for me, it would be even better, right? OK. So we are almost out of time. So I think we should stop here. Unless we have any more questions that can fit into three minutes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Thank you.
So we have a break for 30 minutes. We'll be back in here at 3 o'clock.